a member of the English department. Um, the Scholars Forum in the Catholic intellectual tradition um, is starting its second year, and we're really excited about that. Uh, this is our first presentation for the fall of 2021, and uh, we're getting off to a wonderful start with this presentation. Um, this, uh, this whole program started with the idea that we would have faculty presenting on their recently published or soon to be published books that were related in one way or another to the Catholic intellectual tradition. And it's really been exciting to me to just listen to the wonderful scholarship coming out of our faculty. We really are blessed with a wonderful group of faculty. Um, and it takes place online, usually every other week on Wednesdays at 4 p.m. There's one week in October where we have another event. Um, it is co-sponsored by the uh, Catholic Studies Program, the Catholic Studies Center, the Department of Religion, and the Immaculate Conception Seminary School of Theology. So it really is a, is a collaboration from a group of us who really want to, uh, you know, celebrate our colleagues. Um, it's an example of harvesting our treasures and our faculty scholars are truly among those treasures. Uh, Bernard Lonergan said, a university is a reproductive organ of cultural community. Its constitutive endowment lies not in buildings or equipment, civil status or revenues, but in the intellectual life of its professors. Its central function is the communication of intellectual development. And in light of that, we are pleased to welcome our first presenter for this, our second year of the Scholars Forum, Dr. David Opterbeck of Seton Hall University School of Law. I have seen David present before, but it was at our faculty talent show. And I can say that he is a very talented musician. However, he is also an accomplished scholar. And tonight we'll be presenting on his latest book, The End of the Law, Law, Theology and Neuroscience. Dr. Casey Choi, Chair of the Department of Religion and Coordinator of Core 2, will give the introduction. And I want to mention that also that Professor Maribel Landrau, Assistant Director of the University Corps, will be helping in coordinating the Q&A, particularly with the chat. So, Dr. Choi. Great. Thank you, Dr. Enright. Um, so, I have the, the honor and pleasure of introducing David Okterbeck um, to our Scholars Forum. He is a Professor of Law and Co-Director of the Gibbons Institute of Law, Science and Technology. His work focuses on intellectual property, cybersecurity and technology law and policy. Prior to his academic career, David was a partner in the, in the intellectual property information technology practice at McCarter and English. In addition to his distinguished work in the legal arena, David is also a distinguished theologian with keen interest in the relation, relationship between theology, law, and science. And by the way, he will be teaching a course on this topic in the Department of Religious Studies next semester. He holds a PhD in systematic and philosophical theology from the University of Nottingham in the United Kingdom. Since receiving his PhD in theology, David has published the book Law and Theology, Classic Questions and Contemporary Perspectives, published by Fortress Press in 2019. Steve Long, a distinguished professor of ethics at Southern Methodist University, who is currently um, the president of the Society of Christian Ethics, said this of David's book. Quote, I know of no other book like this. Hopterbeck develops a constructive theology of law that draws upon his deep knowledge of theology and the theory and practice of law. He offers substantive reflection on God's being and attributes, superbly navigating the various controversies such reflection brings for the purpose of constructing a theology of law that makes a significant contribution to moral and political theology. The breadth of knowledge is impressive, end quote. And I've heard David speak on his first book um, before, and um, I agree with, with Steve Long wholeheartedly on um, the impressiveness of his first book. David's most recent book is, of course, the topic of today's Scholars Forum in the Catholic Intellectual Tradition. This is his second book published by Cascade, and it is titled The End of the Law, that's with the question mark, Law, Theology, and Neuroscience. And to give you a sense of this book's prominence, consider the following endorsement from the preeminent theologian John Milbank. By the way, um, his second book has endorsements from, from phenomenal 
um, colleagues in, in theology and ethics. Um, I'm totally jealous of, of all of the blurbs that he got. But anyway, uh, this is um, the one from, from um, I said preeminent, but also uh, um, infamous, I should say, uh, theologian John Milbank, who wrote, quote, this excellent book shows in a highly lucid fashion how contemporary neuroscientism trades upon a notion of legality to which it has no right in order to deny the very ground of the possibility of law, which is the lawmaking capacity of spiritual creatures that participates in the eternal law of God. No previous book has so successfully shown how scientific positivism trades on the incoherence of legal positivism much more than the other way around. It seriously illuminates the vicious biopolitics of our time and indicates the way beyond, end quote. Now, if that blurb, if that endorsement doesn't make you go out and buy David's book, then I have no idea um, what endorsement um, will do that for you. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor David Operbeck to our first Scholars Forum of the new academic year. David, welcome. Thank you so much. Um, I don't think I can live up to that introduction, but I'll, I'll uh, at least try to give a little bit of a feel for what I was trying to uh, do, uh, whether successfully or not, in this book. And I'm, I'm going to share my screen because I have a, a couple of slides that just help summarize it a little bit. So pull that up. Now I've got to refind you here on, on Teams. There you are. Great. All right, so um, you know, in the next 10 minutes or so, I'm just going to try and give an overview of, of at least some of the things I'm trying to do in, in the book. And you know, one of the things that I like to do uh, is try to do kind of integrative scholarship that's bringing together a lot of uh, different fields and um, you know a lot of different themes and that always has, you know, the usual pitfalls, which uh, you're, you're trying your best to kind of um, be be uh, sort of faithful to the fields that you're not an expert in and summarize and bring in. Um, but you're, you know, you're always going to miss some some things. Um, but I, to me, this is an, an important thing that I, a important kind of work that I, I like to do. So um, tried my best to do it. Maybe succeeded, maybe didn't. Oops, hit the wrong button there. So. So, you know, neural law and, and uh, you know, what is neural law? And that's really the thing that I'm, that that touched off um, a lot of the reflections that I'm doing in this book. So on the one hand, this idea of neural law is, is sort of just a kind of ordinary, sanguine, interesting development in legal scholarship, which is just taking the best evidence we have from neuroscience and, you know, seeing how it might serve within the legal system. And so, for example, there are cases about um, does a, a brain scan uh, potentially show diminished capacity for, you know, a custody hearing or for uh, a criminal case in which uh, there might be, you know, the old term we'd use is a, a, a insanity defense, things like that. And I think all those things are really useful and important. And there's bodies of scholarship that just focus on that. And that's but that's not really my concern. My real concern is a much broader critique uh, about a, a jurisprudential critique from the perspective of uh, or the presumed perspective of the neurosciences on the emphasis within law on human freedom. And you know, here's just a couple of quotes from some people who are engaged in this field. So Martha Farah is a, a neuroscientist who has you know, stood up this center on neuroscience and society. Uh, and you know, this quote she's kind of saying it's it's hard to reconcile um, the I, the deterministic ideas behind neuroscience and our ideas of agency in the legal system. Um, and in fact, she goes further than that and says they're really incompatible. Um, and then, you know, more uh, an even more sort of um, blunt quote from somebody writing in this area. You know, neuroscience says, according to this author, uh, that we're not responsible for our actions. Our, our actions are our brains. Um, we're part of this deterministic system. And even though we don't fully understand um, that whole system today, uh, at least in theory, according to this view, we could entirely understand it. And even the notion that we possibly could fully understand how our 
uh, brains are determined and how our neurochemistry really determines how we act um, will really do away with pretty much the entire Western legal tradition, which is which is based on notions of um, consent, notions of accountability and, and notions of freedom, both in the criminal law and and in the uh, civil law. So it's a really radical challenge to um, our presumed conceptions to the rule of law. But uh, as I'm going to discuss and as I talk about in the book, um, although it's radical, I think it's uh, very much in line with uh, a, a historical trend. And in many ways, it's sort of the apotheosis of, of sort of a modern trend of thinking about law and jurisprudence, all of which, by the way, I think is gravely mistaken. But I'll, I'll talk about why, why I think that. Um, you know, so if you're you're hearing this, uh, all of this raises uh, a whole bunch of related problems, and this is where the project is sort of really deeply uh, cross disciplinary for better or worse. I mean, um, the entire question of um, neuro neuroscience and the kind of prevailing view, I would say it's fair to say the prevailing view among um, scientific practitioners in this domain. Um, is that really it does sort of elide completely the, the idea of the mind. It, it, it kind of cements the fact, um, you know, that Descartes was wrong and we're not uh, body and soul. And of course, many of them have this really narrow understanding of what that even means and, you know, uh, sort of talk about it as if Descartes was uh, the, the high point of this whole idea, right, which of course he isn't. But it raises all these big questions in the philosophy of mind. Relatedly, deep, long-standing, intractable questions about, about freedom and determinism that well predate, you know, that are ancient questions, of course. Um, very interestingly to me, and something I focused on in this book, that, that quote from, from Garland that I put up before, you know, talks about this deterministic system. And it's really, it, you know, it almost sounds like he's just, uh, you know, talking about the Newtonian universe. Um, and it's relating to this idea of the laws of nature. And if there's laws that determine uh, the physical aspects of nature, and if our, uh, our our brains are, you know, physical as well, then presumably those laws, um, you know, do that as uh, do the same thing with with our behavior. But it invokes a big uh, field of debate about whether there are, in fact, laws of nature. And if there are, how how, in fact, we would conceive of them. Um, and there's one strand of that I put, pick up on in the book that I'll, I'll talk about in a bit. Um, you know, the question of whether there's a natural law. Now, uh, in my in my first book that Casey mentioned, I kind of developed a uh, a take on natural law of my own uh, that, you know, is an explicitly theological take. So I would call myself in the family of natural law theorists, although I'm really critical of um, sort of the new natural law, which is a uh, an important strand of kind of legal and philosophical scholarship um, led by John Finnis and some other people. Um, so that isn't really my kind of take on it for a bunch of reasons, some of which I talk about in this book. Um, but broadly in, in, in um, you know, legal academia, you know, there are natural law scholars out there, but it is it, but by far not uh, a majority view at this point. So it is a view I take, but it does raise questions. Um, uh, neural law even further sort of amplifies the questions of whether there can be a natural law and how it relates to any concept of positive law. <clears throat> and then this is a project, and really the whole project began, um, you know, for me primarily, and this is, uh, as I say in the forward of the book, it's a revision of my doctoral thesis, which you know, I did at Nottingham, I did with Connor Cunningham, if, if you know that at all, and Milbank was one of my advisors and I have some stories I could tell you about Mill Bank for sure. Yeah. Um, but uh, but I do appreciate and I'll talk about it a little bit some aspects of that school of thought. But it you know raises questions about if I'm trying to to approach this theologically um, and it, within that philosophically, uh, how am I relating that to to the science? And you know the last thing I want to do is sort of be in a position of denying the science. Um, denying the, the the interesting things neuroscience is telling us about ourselves, um, but yet you know what some method or some way of bringing that um, together. 
Uh, and then finally, the whole thing is is ultimately, I think, a, I hope, a work of theological anthropology. So in in using law as kind of the lens, um, I'm asking, you know, what theologically we say a human person is and uh, how, how does that uh, cohere with and potentially differ from the neuroscientific account? Um, and, you know, what can we learn from the neuroscientific account, but what can we also add to it if we're thinking theologically? All right, now I'll do my my sort of uh, Nottingham thing, <laughs> which is, you know, the the, uh, the the genealogical approach to all this. And I'll go through it and then I'll, I'll explain how I try to qualify it. So I talk a little bit in the beginning of the book about, you know, what I'll call the Western jurisprudential tradition um, and its roots, which I think are widely acknowledged in, you know, in the Hebrew scriptures in uh, Greek thought, especially Plato and Aristotle and the Stoics, uh, and then that leading into um, Roman legal thought and then the development of that into Christian legal thought. You know, and all of those strands of thought, of course, which in their own time are contested and have competing schools and, and so on, but, but, are, but are referring this concept of law, positive law, human law, um, to some, some transcendent source, to some concept of, of natural law, contested in their own times, but, you know, sort of this, this stream of thought. And creating problems, you know, which I, I try to at least in passing acknowledge with, within their own times, you know, with... Uh, with slavery and uh, the treatment of women and all those sorts of things, right? Big problems, but a stream of thought that has given rise to what we think of as our, our thoughts about rights and uh, constitutions and things like that. Now, here's the, you know, the the move from Nottingham is uh, the, the kind of decline narrative, which I'm going to really qualify. Um, but I, I, I and I try to spend, you know, a good amount of time in the book really digging into a close reading of some of the sources uh, of SCOTUS and of Occam, if you're familiar with those characters. Um, but I, so I, I don't totally buy the narrative that we can sort of lay the problems of modernity, if we think they are problems, you know, at the feet of the voluntarists and the, and the nominalists at the feet of SCOTUS, as, as Milbank, for example, would say. Um, but I do think there is some there there. Um, and, and in particular, it's uh, a sense of, of flattening transcendence, right? It's a sense of taking um, this God who is really inherently unknowable and yet uh, makes God's self known to us in, in different ways, it, whether, it's, uh, whether it's cataphatically through absence or, or whether it's also through analogy um, you know, kind of flattens that. And for some good reasons, addressing some important things, but that kind of leads to, uh, you know, the, the sense into modern, modernity that, well, what do we need this figure for, right? This figure is sort of just a piece of furniture in the universe, um, and it's, it's actually causing more complications than we need. Um, and in, in, in legal theory, um, you, you start to see that in, into the period of modernity, when important legal theorists are starting to write um, as you know and, and say, well, let's do this as if there were no God. So we believe in God, but let's let's sort of presume there is no God. We still can establish um, the legal principles we want, including for someone like Grotius, um, a natural law. And, you know, the new natural law in many ways is, is uh, you know, leaves off of that in into the modern period that we can we can do this as if there were no God, just sort of just logically. Um, now, there's some benefits to that, I think, but 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 there are some real, in my view, some real problems with that. Um, and then, you know, you sort of uh, follow that into someone like uh, like like Thomas Hobbes, who has an increasingly positivistic view of law. And by positivistic, I mean, it's sort of strictly rational and logical, um, really rejecting the idea of any kind of universals or any or any kind of transcendent, uh, 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 anything above the imminent, um, any kind of transcendence, um, and trying to define law in in that way. And that there is certainly a step between Hobbes and 19th century legal positivism. Now, this isn't uh, the same thing as logical positivism, but it's the same, I think, in many ways, the same kind of 
family of thought and I would say in many ways similar kind of genealogy of thought. But um, 19th century legal positivism and it's uh, embodied in an article in an es famous essay by Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. that I note in, in the book um, is explicitly now saying law and morality have nothing to do with each other. Um, that, you know, any, any notion of natural law, not only natural law, but any notion of morality is really just out of place. What, what the law is, is really whatever the lawmakers are kind of saying it is um, as it's being made. And sort of the, the role for the lawyer and the scholar and the judge um, is to really be looking at scientific tools like, like economics um, or sociology, sociology sort of nation in Holmes's time um, to to engineer the results in the way that um, you know sort of have the best results according to those tools and Holmes is pretty explicit about about that um, and you know this leads to some movements in kind of contemporary legal academia and jurisprudence um, the law and economics movement and I, I do law and economics work I find it really valuable in many ways but you know, aspects of the movement are really uh, either sort of just pragmatist. I, we just we can't get into the metaphysical questions um, or just think they don't they're meaningless questions. And what we can do is kind of engineer using the supposedly scientific tools of, of economics. Interestingly, though, at the same time, the uh, kind of fruits of this include um, two different streams that really conflict with the supposedly scientific law and economics, and all of which debate with each other in, in the literature. So critical legal studies is, uh, you know, uh, kind of a postmodern legal theory movement, again, which I find pieces of it really, really valuable, and I find pieces of critical race theory, which is an offshoot of this, really valuable. Um, but in, you know, the question I have for it, and a question I ask for it sort of indirectly in this book, is you know once you've sort of um, pulled apart those power relations that you see that are constructing the rules, and once you've pulled apart some of the the masks and the rhetoric that you do see, is there something left? Right? Is there anything left that we can refer this to? And many crits would would frankly say no. Um, but then law and behavioral economics, a, a really interesting development, um, t saying along with behavioral economics as a whole. All right, uh, neoclassical economics is a pretense. Uh, people don't act rationally. People actually, you know, usually act irrationally. Um, and in, in, in a strange way, it has a, it's sort of a bedfellow, I think, with critical legal studies. But all of these are ways of sort of, of deconstructing any notion that law has something to do with, uh, with morality in the end. And, you know, I kind of perceive neural, neural law, as I described it before, this reductive kind of neural law as, you know, like I said, the apotheosis of this this whole stream. It's 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 ultimately saying there if there's no even rational way to think about any kind of transcendence or any kind of source for law, um, you know, beyond the, the radically imminent, which is brain chemistry. Um, and it's not there's not no rationality to it at all, really. It, it, it's uh, you know, it's just chemical. All right, so that's sort of my genealogy. Now, um, you know, I have a, a, a long, too long of a chapter on method in theology and science. Um, you know, part of that actually in, in, the, in the theology and science field, people are sort of moving beyond method because we're recognizing that um, each of the special sciences has its own methods of science. And so there's unique methods of engaging theologically with them. But you know the main thing I hoped to accomplish in this chapter, and part of this, you know, if you read it and you'll see, it's I'm interacting with my Dr. Vader's, with Connor Cunningham's work in this field. So that's a lot of what I'm trying to do there. Um, but I am trying to bring into this mix some strands of theological reasoning that haven't been as prominent, I think, in this scholarship. So the post-liberal theology. Um, so I'm engaging with someone like Stanley Hauerwas or Sarah Coakley, who sort of possibly within the post-liberal realm. Um, and then the radical orthodoxy stuff, uh, specifically Connors. Uh, you know, Milbank is not as helpful here, but Connor is. And that's really uh, phenomenology, bringing that into the into this mix. So I hope I'm doing something in that chapter with that. 
there is sort of then a, an underlying theme, you know, is it analytic philosophy versus continental phenomenology uh, in theology and science? Are there ways to bridge those? And I'm sort of working on that a little. Uh, and ultimately, this is a this is a place I am uh, still sort of somewhat sympathetic with uh, my RO, my radical orthodoxy teachers, even though I don't really identify, you know, as a radical orthodoxy person, um, which is that I do think, you know, trying to do this setting theology to the side just doesn't work. I mean, it, it, we're all, it's always invoking questions about God. And so in one sense or another, I think we're always doing theology, even if we're doing a theology, a theology, right? Um, so can we do this? Can, can as a theologian, can I um, provide a, a narrative that's more compelling, um, but, but do it without just fideism, right? Do it without, uh, I mean, I grew up in, in fundamentalist churches that emphasized young earth creationism, which I address a little bit in the book. And then that had its own epistemology that sounds a lot like you know, post-liberalism or RO, right? Um, so how do you do this without falling into that that kind of trap? All right, so that's that chapter in the book. So then I, I uh, have, after sort of trying to do that, I, I try to move a little bit into the, um, the critique, the philosophical and theological critique of neural law, which is more broadly a, a critique of reductionism in, in philosophy and science, um, and then a constructive, approach uh, to a sort of theological response to this. So two strands that, and I, I do this also in my Law and Theology book. Uh, and in fact, you know, Casey mentioned mentions uh, Steve Long, who's a friend, and I, I draw on Steve's uh, effort to talk about Augustinian and ecclesial theological ethics. Um, and I'm doing something similar here. So there's an Augustinian strand where I'm, where I'm thinking of, of law, both natural, natural law and the positive law that participates in it, really as uh, not an affirmative thing, but, but more as a sense of lack or a sense of loss. Uh, you know, as Augustine talks about memory, um, the, the loss of innocence in, in Eden. Um, and I, I sort of riff on the, um, the command not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in, in Eden as, as a law, right, as one of the first divine commands and the first forms of positive law is actually something that constitutes us as human in relation to God, um, which we, of course, lost because we're we don't have that innocence anymore. Um, but then also a more positive uh, Thomistic Aristotelian sense about uh, law in relation to our powers and capacities as human beings and to teleology, to what we think, uh, you know, to a good society being something that's moving toward a, a goal. Um, and this in particular is where I connect with uh, what I think is an important um, modern stream of uh, philosophy and philosophy of science, which is uh, labeled the newest Aristotelianism. Um, so these folks, they're not, you know, they're, they, they're not Thomists by any means. I mean, some of them, a couple of people on the edges, maybe, you know, but they're uh, they're not mostly non-religious philosophers um, or not specifically religious philosophers who are sort of reinvigorating um, the Aristotelian ideas about causality and in particular about potentiality and powers um, to sort of recast the debate about laws of nature. Um, you know, which is in itself in the in the philosophy of science literature large and intractable. But I found it really appealing, and I tried to connect that. Um, so the law, laws of nature, in this sense, are not really deterministic. We're not also just sort of punting based on you know the Heisenberg uncertainty or something like that. But but what the laws do more than constrain is actually empower. Is actually you know are are the powers and capacities of things to be and to act um, in. Uh, within what I would call creation theologically or within nature or in the universe. Um, so the the uh, substrate or the ability of our brains to function based on their neural chemistry, you can sort of reconceive as not so much a constraint. Of course, it does constrain, but as a power and a capacity um, that that then can invoke goals and in, in teleology in a way that a more Newtonian sort of view of it can't.
All right, and then in the more the much more theological key, um, you know, I, I connect this with with Christology. And what I'm really trying to do here, you know, back to my method in theology and science, take this narratival approach, um, which is you know consistent between post-liberal and and RO theologies. It's it's not so much an analytic proof that you know my Christian view of this is better than the the atheistic neuroscientist view of this. Um, but you know which story rings more true, which which story makes more sense of the human condition, um, and is more compelling. I think that's kind of the best you can do. Um, but then connecting that to how this ties together in Christology. So uh, Christ as the logos of creation, um, which is where I get my concept of of natural law from, uh, building into creation its rationality, but also its suffering, and also uh, the, fundamentally the law of love. Um, law and Chalcedon, and by this I mean um, the full humanity and full divinity of Christ as the uh, bringing together of this transcendent law of the Lagos and the imminence of creation in particular of us as human beings. And then of course Christ as the one who perfectly fulfills the law, in particular the law of love. And, and in that, in our theological sense, is really the true Adam, the true human, and reconstitutes humanity. And within this, there's a, I don't have time to talk about it, but if you have some, if you have some questions, you know, there's a, there's some really important theology and science scholarship that, uh, and as well as philosophy of mind scholarship about um, emergentism and, and the emergent, uh, the possibility of um, mind as sort of an emergent property. I think all that's really valuable, although I think the way most of it has been, certainly in the theology and science literature, has been framed um, is, is a, a, a problem. And it's particularly a problem, I think, for Christology, because it doesn't seem to leave space for a human nature, capital N, nature, um, which, which seems to not leave space for Christ to actually uh, embody and act on behalf of us all and to redeem us all. All right. Um, and then law and fulfillment. So in Christ, the fulfillment of the law, um, in and in the resurrection, the promise of the eschatological fulfillment, um, you know, which connects back to that Augustinian theme as well as the Aristotelian theme. We're we're not there yet. We're in this in between space, and and yet it's already arrived, and and it is coming, and there's something uh, toward which we're moving. Um, so there's a bunch of different figures I I talk about in that sense in the book. And a few things uh, before I just, you know, stop uh, talking myself. Some questions I don't touch, um, which I, I may try to touch in some later book. Um, you know, a broader articulation of my vision of natural law, I do, I do that in law and theology, um, but there's more of that I could do. This is the one that's most unsettling for me personally. Um, you know, many of the people I studied with are, you know, real critics of uh, of liberalism, um, and you know not only the RO folks, but also some of the folks like Hauerwas, who I appreciate, are real cr critics of liberalism. And yet, I teach constitutional law, um, and you know, and I just uh, you know had this you know passionate class this morning about the post 9/11 um, uh, ways in which that challenged our constitutional order and often often broke it. Um, and how important I think the rule of law is and our constitutional order is there. Um, and yet I'm writing in this vein of critiques of liberalism. Uh, I, I don't think the Benedict option is a viable option. Um, I, you know, I am not, uh, uh, you know, in, in any sense, um, the Adrian Vermeule type of, of person who, who's sort of uh, advocating theocracy. Um, so what do I do? Right with all that, I'm not sure. Um, uh, and 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 related to that, you know, I'm I'm giving my specifically Christian political theology and and really highlighting why I think Christology is important to it. How does that relate to? And that's a kind of particularism. How does it relate to religious pluralism? I'm particularly personally concerned with how that relates um, with Jewish thought about law, uh, although I haven't done anything with that yet. All right, so there's there's my thoughts. Uh, here I am in my office pondering those thoughts. <laughs> and 
we'll see if anybody has any any other thoughts or, or questions. I'll try to stop sharing. Thank you, David. I, I took a whole lot of notes on this and I, I know I have a question, but I, I'm going to open it up to anybody else uh, first. Um, so whoever would like to jump in. And at, with the questions, you can either just uh, you know raise your hand or just ask uh, David, or you can put it in the chat, and uh, uh, Professor Landrau will uh, you know articulate it for you if you prefer to do it that way. It looks like we have well, Father Laracy. Thank you. Thank you for a wonderful uh, lecture. I I, uh, I really enjoyed your presentation, and I look forward to uh, taking a look at your book. Theology and science is is my area of of uh, research, and um, so I'm interested to know more about um, your chapter engaging method in theology and science, um, especially if you draw on our in any way our our hometown hero, the late Father Stanley Yaki, uh, Ian Barber, or any any of the other um, figures that that uh, are you know commonly used. Thank you. Yeah, sure thing. Yes, yeah, so I, I I didn't specifically talk about Stanley Yaki, though I do appreciate his work, and um, you know I do draw on on Barber and some others, you know, insofar as they're uh, they're sort of talking about the um, paradigms that that have been used in, in method in theology and science. And, you know, if I kind of look at those paradigms, there is a sort of uh, um, neo-Aristotelian slash Thomistic paradigm, which I suppose is, is if I fell into any of those, I would fall into those, but I'm also trying to stretch those buckets a little bit. And that is particularly why I'm trying to bring in the post-liberal and RO folks. And, you know, believe it or not, uh, and I'm sure most many of you know this, but um, you know Stanley Howard Howard gave a Gifford lecture, and that's like <laughs> almost inconceivable, right? But it was really good, and and I, uh, you know, I kind of riff on what he's doing there, and uh, as well as Coakley's, I really loved Coakley's Gifford lectures, and um, you know, if I sort of uh, jive with anyone, it, it's probably Coakley um, with a little bit of gloss, but she does emphasize, I think, in those lectures that. You know, as theologians, we ought to not be afraid to be theological. Um, and there, you know, there's gonna, there's just not going to be a sort of perfect method of correlation between, um, you know, non-atheological reasoning and theological reasoning. Which again doesn't mean we have to be fideistic. Um, I love Bart too, right? But I'm gonna sort of, and I do have some stuff on, you know. Uh, Bart in the Analogia and to some what he's really saying and all that. But but um, so yeah, that's that's where I'm trying to go with that to sort of express it in a in an explicitly the an unapologetically theological key, but not being fideistic. Great, thank you so much. Thanks, Dr. Stogdale, please. Thank you, Maribel. Uh, David, thank you so much for that presentation. Todd Stogdale here. We got yeah. to see each other and spend a little bit of time together, maybe six seven years ago, and. I'm a little sad I don't see you as much anymore. So yeah. um, maybe we can wind up in the same places in the future. Um, I had my hand up because uh, there was a break in uh, the questions there. And I thought anytime there'd be a break, I would ask you to share one of those Milbank stories that you said you could share. <laughs> uh, but, I'd be happy to do that. Yeah. So look, maybe, uh, maybe, maybe if there's a break, David, we can do that. Um, but uh, Father Laracy got in and asked the questions. I, I figured I'd better come up with an actual question for you. Um, you, you talked about kind of this experiment uh, in your genealogy with kind of developing a natural law without God. And I just wonder if you could say more about that. Help me understand kind of what that looks like. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, so Hugo Grotius is one of the great uh, theorists of international law and still is still is kind of the foundations of modern international law. Go, go back to Grotius, you know, who's writing uh, during the Westphalian settlement and uh, and Grotius is a great natural law theorist as well in the modern period. But, you know, Grotius writes, and I you know, have the, this part in the book, it says, let's proceed, even though it would be wicked to do so, let's, let's see if we can proceed as if there were no God. Um, and so he is already trying to, you know, justify um, to sort of the Enlightenment mind this concept of, of natural law. 
Um, and so I, that's problematic for a couple of reasons, I just substantively, but I also just think methodologically or even sort of doing it that way. So the new natural law, people like Finnis, um, are, are doing something similar. Uh, and, uh, you know, they're in many ways really responding to Kant. Um, and I, I just think the whole project is mistaken. I mean, um, and, 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 and I don't think it's even totally uh, being straight intellectually. I mean, it's just remarkable that, you know, all of Finnis's deliverances of reason happen to coincide perfectly with his understanding of the magisterium, you know. Um, so, but, uh, you know, I, but even just, just substantively, I just don't think it works. And there are others who've created, you know, Russell Hittinger's, I draw on his critique of that, that, you know, let's not try to hide the metaphysical ball. Let's, let's bring it out in the open. And, and that's where, I, that's where I critique that. The Milbank story in real brief, when I, when I defended my PhD, I, I got a copy of his new book that was just out then, read it on the plane, um, brought it out just before the defense started. And he said, oh, my God, this shouldn't be in print because um, it wasn't supposed to come out yet. He called the publisher on the phone right there and reamed them out for having got released it early. And then I said, oh, Professor Milbank, this, I have a I have a rare edition. Would you sign this for me? And he did. Uh, and I passed, you know, maybe just because of that. <laughs> Dr. Floyd, please. Yeah, thank you, David. Wonderful presentation. Uh, I also now have another book to add to my list. Um, but I'm, I'm also interested in this question of sort of not hiding our, our theological priors. You're making me think it's a good thing Mike Ambrosio couldn't make the call, given all the shots you're taking at Finnis. <laughs> um, now, Michael loved the book. You know, he, he knows my, my feelings about this, and he kind of just dismisses it. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> I guess my question is, um, what role do you see potentially in for for philosophy and by philosophy i mean not a not a positivistic philosophy but a sort of more capacious historical phenomenological we could fill in some of the gaps but a sort of philosophy open to the possibility of transcendence or maybe even the reality of it in sort of mediating between if there's a role for that theological and atheological discourses around these kind of issues yeah that's great and of course mediation is a big uh theme in radical orthodoxy mm -hmm. um and i do think uh, that's that's part of what they're trying to do. You know, Milbank's really into sophiology, which I don't quite get. But anyway, uh, <laughs> that's part of his idea of mediation. Yeah, so I do get that. Although I, I am, uh, as a theologian, uh, on the, in this side of my hat that I wear, right, as a philosophical theologian, um, maybe I'd call myself a theological philosopher. Uh, <laughs> I just don't see philosophy without theology and I still do see the the what I think is the classically Christian sense of philosophy being development and clarification of theology so maybe in that sense mm -hmm. it is a meeting thing but I'm nervous I'm personally nervous about giving it an independent space mm -hmm. uh, and, and partly because I just as my convictions say there is no independent space mm -hmm. it just doesn't exist and so we're going to pretend there's an independent space we're in my view um you know, not not doing something as straightforward as I would want. It was just maybe one minor follow up. I, I, to, I wonder then, is there still a space for a kind of a, like a, a mere theism in what you're describing then? Or maybe it would have to be a mere Christianity, given what given the kind of Christological focus. Um, so a sort of uh, so that'd be more than philosophy. So I'm sort of shifting the question a bit. But it, I'm thinking about like, well, what would this grounding of law look like in a pluralist society or something like that? Yeah, I, I agree. That, and that's that's what I said is one of the big open questions. Yeah. And I don't know. And I, 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 I am, you know, not going with anywhere near with a hundred foot pole in integralism. I'm not going near. Mm -hmm. Sure. I, you know, I, um, but I don't know. I, I, that's something I need to personally think through. Um, mm -hmm. I also don't, you know, quite buy into to the extent I can even penetrate it grammatically Milbrandt Banks <laughs> version of of Christian socialism. Um, I might be attracted to some of those ideas. Um, but again, how does that look? And how does it look? Uh, the one thing for me with Mil Milbank's political theology, he's, he's so obviously writing in this British context that it's very, very hard to even think about how to translate it into an American context. Um, so anyway, yep, that's something I have to work on. Great. No, wonderful questions. I'd love to talk about them more. Yeah, good. <laughs>
Dr. Mary, please. Well, I can't claim to be a doctor, but um, maybe I'll take it for this question. His, uh, wife, right, his wife's yeah. a real doctor. My you? wife's a real doctor, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm, just, I'm just a country lawyer. So, um, so David, this is all fascinating stuff, and I just came from teaching jurisprudence, so I especially appreciated it. Um, so I have two questions. One is specific to the phenomenon of neuro law, right? So uh, within like traditional natural law, right? Um, so I'm thinking like Thomas here uh, or earlier, you've got like this idea that positive law is basically underdetermined, right? And then whether it's metaphysical or other, or coming from medical physical premises or others, uh, you can kind of fill in the gaps, right? And that's why some people kind of say like Thomas might be like the first like actual positivist. So on neuro law, is neuro law actually underdeterminate or indeterminate or fully determinate when it comes to positive law? Like, because on the one end, I could see that it would be uh, uh, fully determinate, right? Uh, because in fact, like we're just, you know, uh, automatons bouncing from one thing to the other and the structures we create just correlate to that. But on the other hand, it seems like it could be indeterminate because um, there's so so much complexity there that any structures that we create are going to kind of like constantly be refined. Um, so I, I would just ask that um, to as by way of comparison to the other um, uh, legal philosophies that you had on your your trajectory there, like where it precisely kind of fits um, as it relates to the positive law. Um, my second question, which is a d totally different field, I guess, or a totally different issue, is on like some of the unanswered questions that you you mentioned at the end. Um, like, is it possible? And maybe this goes to Greg's point. Like, is it possible that the adjudicatory principle that we're talking about here, it's not integralist, it's not fiercely liberalist, right? But it's instead like some sort of hybrid model. Um, that has like a theistic component, but not an exclusively Christological one. Um, so it's like the God, at, you know, at the, the, fir the first figure of the Trinity, but not the rest of it, right, in a pluralistic society. So um, I'll stop there. Good. Uh, yeah, I mean, so on the first part, I, I think uh, n there's two different, uh, as I see it, kind of schools of thought among people who are sort of advocating neural law in a sense, in this sense, right? So there's one that's sort of uh, moderate and pragmatist. Uh, and this is like, um, uh, I'm forgetting the guy's name right now. Um, and, and you know, that view is, it's kind of like um, a strong compatibilist, compatibilist view of freedom. Um, and all right, so let's let's sort of agree that probably at the end of the day, it's all determinism. But we still have to act as though we have freedom, and and we can and acting as though we have freedom is it is rational in itself, and acting as if people are free is rational in itself, and and so really that you know there there might be over time changes to the positive law or the way we think about it at the margins, but it's not going to radically change even though it does radically change the philosophical basis for it. That's the kind of the more moderate school. There's a more radical school which I think is just incoherent. Um, you know, which uh, like David Eagleman is one of my main foils in, in the book. Um, he's not a lawyer, he's a neuroscientist, but, you know, he basically goes all in and says, hey, there's this, let's get rid of our old concepts of law. Now, he has, he has actually, and, and he and others in his vein have some good reasons for it because, uh, well, maybe good, maybe, maybe you'd push back against this given your scholarship, right? But um, the notion that criminal punishment is always punitive. And, and they want criminal punishment to be rehabilitative. Um, and so someone like Eve would say, now we understand it's not anybody's fault. There's no point in punishing anyone, but we can rehabilitate. Um, and he actually proposes like neural workout. And I think he actually uses the word camps, which is pretty um, unfortunate for him. <laughs> you know, neural workout camps. Um, the problem, I mean, obviously the incoherence of it is well, who would decide that? Like, who would decide at what point along some distribution, uh, normal distribution of behaviors is outside the bounds or not? It's a normative judgment. And they're just constantly importing normative judgments where they claim there can't be normative judgments.
judgments. So I think there's those sort of those sort of two streams. Um, yeah, and on the on the later question, actually, what I'm thinking is Christology again is kind of the answer uh, because it, the logos is the universal Christ. Although, it, so the particular the particularity of Christ is also the universality of Christ in you know patristic Christian thought, for example. Um, so it is within that particularity that I find the resources for a, 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 a um, rational pluralism. Um, but that's my sort of philosophical and religious perspective. I have no idea how to relate that to positive law in a, you know, a, po a post-liberal order. And I think I'm guessing that my own view is going to have to be, um, uh, you know, in some sense, liberalism, uh, classical liberalism is sort of the best we've got. Um, and, and without imposing theocracy, which I don't want to even go near, um, you know, there's other in, uh, other organs of society that work towards that, I guess. I don't know. Dr. Choi, please. Yeah, um, here, David, um, great. This is this has been fun. Um, and I think you might have touched upon this a little bit with, um, um, I won't say Dr. Murray, but Professor Murray's. Um, uh, first part of his question, but um, maybe I can restate it a little bit. And this is coming from, you know, very little um, sort of knowledge of, of neuroscience and neuro law. Um, but um, I, I would venture to say that in at least Christian social ethics, the, or and particularly in Catholic social ethics, the trend now is a focus on the, the role that institutions, systems, um, traditions, ideologies, whatever, um, are are delimiting um, uh, persons and communities' agency. Um, it, and it sounds like there's some maybe intersections, resonances with the way that neuroscience is perhaps talking about um, about agency and and so forth. Maybe I again um, I speak about I say that about neuroscience and neuro law with limited knowledge of it. Um, but if 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 my if my understanding of of the direction that Christian slash Catholic social ethics is moving in, um, it would seem that there 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 would be some important lessons to draw from neuroscience and, and neuro law. Would there not be? I, I mean, right now it sounds like um, you're you're wholly suspicious of it, or at least. Um, all right, maybe that's too strong of a characterization, but you you certainly are are you're you're not on their side. Let me put it that way. <laughs> well, I mean, so but let's define the they, right? So the the they that I'm really responding to is that reductive school of neural law, and and I I completely agree, and this is why you know the the, the method in theology and science and all that was important to me. Uh, and I do talk at some points in the book about sort of the the classical idea of virtue and the 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 need to discipline and create and and engage in habits, right? And now we know we have neurological scientific basis for the fact that habits change our brains. Um, so that's ah, great. Yeah, I mean, let's uh, totally embrace that, and that's helpful. And likewise, that softer aspect of neural law that I mentioned in the beginning, you know, where we know that like a brain's, you know, there's brain injury that puts someone outside of a normal distribution. Sure, I mean, diminished capacity, all those kinds of things. Yeah, that's all really important. But what I'm reacting to is, you know, the, this, and there's, there's lots of people in the neurosciences that do this, that jump from the evidences they have to an absolute metaphysical conclusion while they reject metaphysics that this is all we are. That, that's what I'm reacting to. That's very helpful. Thank you. Dr. Enright. Thank you, uh, David. This is so interesting. And um, I just had actually kind of two maybe related questions, but one has to do with, I guess, where you were just going as you were just speaking, um, 
that it, you're not saying that there couldn't be a situation where a person's mental capacity or incapacity makes them less culpable or maybe perhaps even not culpable. You know, I'm thinking like in Hamlet where they, the words are said of Ophelia, you know, she was incapable of her own distress. She, her mental state made it like she couldn't be guilty of actual suicide because she wasn't capable of understanding what suicide was. So I guess that would be an example of that. But I wanted to ask about, you said, I, I, I was taking notes about there was the um, Augustinian Augustinian and the Platonic way of looking at evil, I guess, as a lack, which I, I find always very interesting. And then you said the Thomistic and uh, Aristotelian way, which would be more having to do with power. And I was just wondering if you could just talk, elaborate that on that a little bit. Yeah, and this was actually, it wasn't uh, a way of looking at the problem of evil, although I agree that's that's related uh, to this, but it's, it's a way of thinking about um, how to sort of rationally demonstrate the reality of, of natural law of transcendence. Um, and as I'm conceiving it, you know, the, the sort of more Augustinian way that I'm, you know, as I'm framing it, and it's just, just a broad category term, is we know we're missing something. You know, we know, we're, we know there's something we individually, we societally are falling short of. Um, and maybe we can't even totally define it. And there's a part in the book where I play off uh, Derrida had a, an essay about law and power, and, and I'm kind of playing off some of that with the, with this theme. Um, but it's a way of demonstrating that there's something missing. And, and, and I think it, you know, the natural sort of, I think many people's gut reaction to this reductive kind of neural law is, you know, that can't be right. We're, there's obviously something we're missing. The neural lawyers would say, ah, it's just your evolutionary response and whatever. But I, you know, I think there's a there there. That's yeah. what I'm getting at there. And then the Aristotelian side is um, a, a little more uh, affirmative. Maybe it's, you know, uh, apophatic and cataphatic, right? A more affirmative way of looking at it that we can see uh, creation. We can see ourselves moving toward some good goal. Uh, and uh, law is having sort of a role and the natural laws sort of having a role in in helping us move toward that goal and the seeing of that, the realizing that there's something we're moving toward. There's a there there as well, I, I would say. OK, thank you very much. That was very interesting. Well, I, I our time is is up and this time has flown by. So uh, we just want to thank you so much, uh, David. This was wonderful uh, and you really got us off to a great start. So great. Well, I appreciate the questions and it was fun to have an opportunity to, to talk about this stuff with you. And I see it's a couple of my students attended. I'm glad you guys made it. So that that's great. And uh, our next uh, scholars forum is going to be in two weeks with Dr. Stacy Transenkos of the of the Catholic Studies uh, program. So we're looking forward to that. And I want to thank uh, KC for your beautiful introduction and thank you Maribel for handling the questions and thank you everybody for coming. Okay, bye good night, everyone. Have Thanks. Have a good day. It was great seeing you, Monsignor. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody.